Thank you. I'd like now to introduce the, uh, the person who's in the, the family of God radio broadcast, chiefly uh, responsible and in charge of, of censoring uh, Vern's terrible parables. That's uh, Nancy Grimsley. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, what I'm really here to do is tell you just a little bit about the Family of God broadcast and the Family of God Foundation. The Foundation sponsors the broadcast. Um, the Family of God Foundation was established in 1967 for, and I quote, the sole purpose of proclaiming the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. The radio broadcast and meetings such as this one are the two main projects of the Foundation right now. And some of the work involved in these is, of course, the work of the preparation of the radio broadcast, including the researching and the writing and the hours of taping and preparing the final tapes that are mailed to stations. There's handling all the correspondence with listeners, which Vern does personally. There's preparation of pamphlets, which are mailed upon request without charge. And there are the regular duties of record keeping and bookkeeping. The expenses of the foundation are many. One of the biggest expenses we have is the purchase of airtime. For example, the San Francisco station alone, KFAX, costs around $1,000 a month which is very expensive, but it is a very powerful station, 50,000 watts, and it does reach a great number of people for this sum of money. Others of the expenses are for the recording equipment, some for the recording tape, for the pamphlets, and the office expenses. The funds of the foundation come entirely from private contributions. We do not receive any support from another organization or institution. We established the foundation as an agency to handle the funds of the broadcast, and it, it is officially recognized as a nonprofit organization under the laws of the federal government and of the state of California, and therefore all contributions are tax deductible. Henry Ward Beecher, the God knowing preacher of Civil War days, once said God asks no man whether he will take life. That is not the choice. He must take it. The choice is how. That choice is a part of life. No one of us is exempt from it. And it's very important. It makes a difference. John Ruskin phrased it this way, I think. He said, the question is not what a man can scorn or disparage or find fault with, but what he can love and value and appreciate. We all make choices every day of our lives. Some of them are big ones, but a good many of them are small ones. And I personally think that the apparent unimportance of the small decisions of life is exceedingly misleading, because taken together, the small choices make up by far the bulk of our life decisions. Mankind recognizes the importance of the big decisions of life, the big choices, and are often able to rise to meet them with courage and with strength. And yet oftentimes they then fail to use this same courage and this same strength in meeting the smaller choices of life, the choices that determine our daily behavior. The choice of, as John Ruskin said, of whether to scorn or to love, to disparage or to value, to find fault with, or to appreciate. We're not able to control much of the outer environment around us. We can't control the other fellow. We can't control the weather, or a good many things. But we can control our inner environment by the choices that we make. And these are very important. Many men in many cultures down through the ages have recognized this fact. There is an Arabian proverb that says, that which is in the heart will rise up to the tongue. And the Old Testament writer said, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Down through the ages, the religions of the world have dealt with this question, as raised by Henry Ward Beecher, of how to take life. And they have come up with some amazingly similar answers, I think. In the words of Jesus, 
thou shalt do unto others as you would have others do unto you. When this is phrased in the negative way, don't do to another what you would not him, have him do to you, it's called the silver rule. Phrased in the positive way of Jesus, it's called the golden rule. And it's found in one form or the other in a great many of the religions of the world. And this golden rule of life is a supernal guide as an answer to the proposition put forth by Henry Ward Beecher. God asks no man whether he will take life. That is not the choice. He must take it. The choice is how. Thank you. And I want to say one other thing, too. This is not only my wife, this is my partner, and she has been a delightful help in everything we've done in this work. And those of you who have good marriages and know what it is to share the love of another person know what I feel, I think, in, in having this one. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to <laughs> What he's trying to do is get me not to censor his terrible parables. <laughs> it's intense. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Ye are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is good for nothing but to, ca to be cast out and trodden under foot of man. In Jesus' time, salt was precious. It had been universally known for some time as a flavoring and a preservative. The Salt preservation power, as a matter of fact, was the power that helped our ancestors carve out a good many of the wildernesses of the world. Salt has been used as a form of money. The Roman army even received a salt allowance. And our modern term salary is derived from an earlier form of the word salt. But the greatest culinary asset of salt is its in its ability to enhance the flavor of other foods, and it only takes a very small amount to do this. For example, in the average cookie recipe, one uses around two cups of flour and around one half teaspoon of salt. This is only a very small bit, but it makes a very big difference. Now, if Jesus had said, ye are the flower of the earth, I think we would have been justified in interpreting him to mean that great quantities were necessary for effectiveness. But he didn't say this. He selected the term salt. And in that same discourse, he went on to say, Love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. And pray for those that despitefully use you. If you love only those who love you, what do ye more than the others? I say unto you, you should repay evil with good. This sort of behavior has been termed in the world as impractical, unrealistic, and totally unsuited to our modern way of life. But to my way of thinking, this sort of behavior is exactly the salty savor this world has need of. Oscar Wilde once said, the cynic knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. The cost of salt right now is quite minimal. I looked up my last purchase at home and I was able to get 26 ounces of salt for 13 cents. And that works out to be two ounces of salt for one penny. It's indeed quite minimal. But it's also interesting to remember that in ancient times, the only way man had of flavoring his food was to dip his meat in the ashes. And yet over all these years, from ancient times, to now when you can get two ounces of salt for a penny. The ability of salt to enhance the flavor of other foods has not diminished. And so it is with the teachings of Jesus. Their ability over all these years to enable men to go out and live their lives by the power of love has not diminished. As Jesus said, if ye love only those who love you, what do ye more than other men? But I say unto you, you should be able to repay evil with good and love your enemies. And it is in this manner that the earth is salted.
In dealing with some of our brothers on this planet, the application of some of Jesus' teachings, those of brotherly love and forgiveness, are often difficult and sometimes puzzling. I suppose all of us have wondered now and then where to draw the line, like Simon Peter asking the question, how many times to forgive? I know I've sometimes wondered how much is too much. Doesn't there come a point when one needs to set a limit? This is the question, it seems to me, that, that Peter was asking when he said, where do we draw the line, Master? How many times do we forgive? Up to seven times? And I can sympathize with Peter in asking that question because seven times can seem like quite a bit. If one is called upon to forgive another one, two, three, five, seven times, and then is called on yet again, one could begin to feel a little bit exasperated. But Jesus said, we shouldn't forgive just seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, he said we should forgive, period. And he did this himself. Even when he was put to a most unjust and humiliating death, he was able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When he was able to do that under those sorts of circumstances, I'm forced to believe that he actually meant exactly what he said, and he was rather insistent upon limitless forgiveness and brotherly love. But the practical application in life situations is not always easy. I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about how one would apply Jesus' commandments in a positive way rather than just in a negative, resigned, wishy-washy manner, and how one would deal with the impulse to draw a line, to set a limit somewhere. And once as I was pondering this again, a poem I knew came into my mind, a short poem, and this poem for me became a formula, if you will, for applying the teachings of Jesus. It's by Edwin Markham, and it's called Outwitted, and it goes like this. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. I remember this, or at least I try to remember it, sometimes when I'm tempted to get stubborn. And when I'm inclined to start drawing a line, I remind myself to draw that line into a circle, and a circle big enough to take both of us in. I think parents do this all the time with their children when they become cross or cranky. And Jesus commended parental love, fatherly love, to us as an excellent ideal to follow. And I can't think of a more delightful characterization for this sort of behavior than the inside of Edwin Markham when he said, he drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. <laughs>